Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. My name's Chara, and today we're covering the complete guide to playing Pyramid Head. The Executioner is my favorite killer in Dead by Daylight, but there are definitely some complexities to using his power, both in terms of mechanical ability and the player's ability to make the right decisions at the right time. In this guide, I'm going to walk through the basics of playing Pyramid Head, then talk about gameplay and some tips and tricks on using your rights of judgment and your punishment of the damned attack, and how to know when to hook versus cage a survivor. I'll also be be covering a tier list of all of Executioner's add-ons, and then going through good perks to use on Pyramid Head, and finally some example builds that would work well on him. I have timestamps for everything down below, so feel free to skip ahead to whatever section interests you most. First, an introduction to Pyramid Head's kit. The first part of his kit is the Rites of Judgment. This is when you drag your sword on the ground and leave torment trails, which are the barbed wire looking things. These remain on the ground for 75 seconds. Any survivor that walks or runs over your torment trails will be afflicted with torment. Survivors can crouch over your trails to avoid getting tormented. Survivors that get tormented will trigger Killer Instinct for three seconds, which highlights the survivors in red and provides a visual and audio cue of their location. Tormented survivors also will have the barbed wire coming out of their feet until they are no longer tormented. This can make them easier to track as you can sometimes see the barbed wire going around corners even if you cannot see the survivor themselves. There are restricted areas where you cannot place torment trails. These restricted areas include hook survivors, generators, and the basement. Trails placed in these areas will disappear after about three seconds. You can also release the Rites of Judgment to make a long-ranged attack known as Punishment of the Damned. Punishment of the Damned is an 8 meter long, 1 meter wide wave that projects from you that inflicts a damage state to any survivor in its path, and if there are two survivors in that path, you can hit both of them. Punishment of the Damned can go down incremental slopes, such as hills or the stairs leading to basement. However, it cannot go up slopes, so you cannot hit up the stairs or other inclines. It also can't go through gaps to hit survivors on the other side of them. If survivors are afflicted with torment, you can send them to a cage of atonement when survivors are in the dying state rather than carrying them to a hook. Sending survivors to a cage only takes about two seconds, so it is much faster than hooking survivors. Cages count as a hook state for the survivor, but cages do not work with any hook-related perks from either the killer or survivor side, such as decisive strike, borrow time, or we'll make it for survivors, or pop goes the weasel for killers. If a survivor has reached the second hook stage and they are afflicted with torment, you also have the power to use final judgment on that survivor to execute them using a mini mori, which only takes about three seconds. Torment is only removed from a survivor when they are rescued from a cage of atonement or they rescue another survivor from a cage of atonement. Alright, so moving on to using your power and how to best utilize it in game. During the game, I generally don't walk around creating torment trails all over the map, as this is usually pretty inefficient. Instead, try to be selective about putting down trails in places survivors might not see, such as in tall grass, or behind a corner, or in common choke points, which survivors might accidentally walk or run over. When chasing survivors, try to put torment trails down on a pallet of a loop, or another bottleneck point, such as a doorway. This will often force survivors either to run through the trail and get tormented, or the survivor will have to avoid the pallet or doorway entirely, and you can get a free hit on that survivor. Some survivors will go to great lengths to avoid getting tormented, so make sure to capitalize on that in order to get injured states quickly. Uh, next, moving on to your Punishment of the Damned attack. Your Punishment of the Damned acts as a shockwave, meaning it will surge out from you. This also means that you will have to time your attacks in order to effectively hit survivors. If you are chasing a survivor and approaching a pallet or window, you want to put down your sword early so that you are ready to use your Punishment of the Damned attack um, you want to wait until the survivor is locked in animation, so either vaulting a window or pallet or dropping a pallet. That way you can guarantee the hit on the survivor. The biggest mistake I see beginner executioners make is not putting your sword down early enough. If you wait until after the survivor vaults the window or drops the pallet, it's too late for you to ensure the hit. You can try to guess which way the survivor will run after vaulting, but the survivor normally has three options. They can juke left, they can juke right, or they can remain straight. Unless you are very good at predicting, you're much less likely to hit these shots than if you had put your sword down earlier. Other places to get guaranteed hits 
are hallways or other bottlenecks where the survivors don't have a ton of room to left or right to juke away from your attack. And finally, when survivors rescue other survivors from a hook or cage, they also become locked in animation. So if you time it right, you can hit both survivors after the unhook or rescue action happens. You want to time it so that the survivor is fully on the ground before you release your attack or otherwise it will only hit the survivor who is rescuing. At most loops, if you have your sword planted in the ground while a survivor is approaching a throne, pallet, or window, the survivor has two options. One, they can vault the window or pallet, which is where you release your punishment of the damned attack and get the hit. The second option is that the survivor fakes like they're going to vault the pallet or window, but don't actually. My biggest tip for this is to just be patient. Don't release your attack until you actually see them vaulting. If they don't vault, you can cancel your rights of judgment and hit the survivor with a basic attack. This is one of the biggest strengths of Executioner. Your ability to zone survivors is one of the best in the game. A bonus tip, if the survivor is carrying an item, this is much easier to see happen. If you watch their item as they approach the window, if the item disappears, they are committed to vaulting and you know to release your punishment of the damned attack. If it doesn't disappear, you know they are faking the vault. So this is slightly trickier when pallets are not yet thrown. Survivors here also have two options. One, they again throw the pallet, or two, they keep running past the pallet. Most good survivors will keep running past the pallet because they know you can hit them while they are throwing the pallet. So depending on how big the pallet loop is, often your best bet is to put your sword on the ground, walk through the pallet loop, and then cancel your power and continue chasing them normally. You will eventually make up the distance because you are faster than them and be able to hit them. You can also try to make a smart prediction. Something I really like to do is early in the game when chasing a survivor out of pallet loop, I like to throw a punishment of the damned attack by aiming directly in front of the survivor. This is a little risky because they could totally just dodge out of the way of your attack, but it often works if they're not expecting it, and it kind of sets the precedent that you are an executioner who is not afraid to go for those risky shots. Often Sometimes this gets in their head a little bit, and the next time you are in a similar situation, the survivor might try to dodge like this instead of running straight, allowing you to cancel your power and get the basic attack instead. You can also get hits behind walls or obstacles. This is easiest when you have perks that provide aura reading capabilities, such as I'm all ears or a nurse's calling, uh, but you can try to go for shots based on the sounds of survivors breathing or moaning as well. As you get better at Pyramid Head, you can start trying to go for more prediction shots. Uh, survivors are often predictable. If you recognize patterns in how a survivor plays and runs loops, then you can determine when to use your punishment of the damned attack. If a survivor is always running straight, never looking behind them, you can try to aim ahead of them with your punishment of the damned. If survivors always juke your long-ranged attack, then adapt to this uh, and don't go for those shots. Cancel your rights of judgment and hit them normally. The best survivors will kind of do a combination of these two things as to remain unpredictable. Next, I want to talk about when to hook versus when to cage survivors, which is a key decision you'll have to make. In general, Caging is usually the better option, it is much quicker than hooking, and you are guaranteed a hook stage. Whereas if you try to hook the survivor, other survivors could come and pallet or flashlight save, or the down survivor could wiggle off your grasp. You want to cage survivors when other survivors are nearby, because one, you have somebody nearby to chase, and two, if all the survivors are nearby to you, then they will have to run across the map to rescue the cage survivor, which, which wastes a lot of their time. Cages usually spawn almost as far away from you as they can, and these are the same locations as chest spawns or other killer item spawns such as Freddy's alarm clocks or pig boxes. So if you sur see survivors nearby like greeting a generator or perhaps lurking to get a flashlight save, sending the survivor away in a cage allows you to begin your next chase immediately. It also eliminates the danger of a survivor getting a flashlight or pallet save or sabotaging a nearby hook. Now, there may be situations where you have a survivor tormented and you don't want to cage them. You want to hook that survivor instead when you believe the other survivors are all far away from you. Because if you cage them, they will most likely spawn right next to their teammate who will rescue and heal them before you even have a chance to walk over there or to find another survivor. In those situations, you want to hook 
that survivor to force other survivors to get off their generators, come across the map, and get the unhook. You also want to hook a survivor if the exit gates are powered and you don't have any survivors immediately nearby, because you want to know the location of the hook in order to pressure survivors that may come to try to save them. If you had caged them instead, the survivors could rescue and heal them before running for the exit gate, which will make it hard for you to down them. If you have any hook-related perks, such as Pop Goes the Weasel or Scourge Hook perks, it can also sometimes make sense to hook in order to get their benefit. Caging can also avoid a certain survivor hook-related perks. If you down a survivor who has been recently hooked, you can cage them, which will not activate Decisive Strike. If a survivor has reached their second stage, you can perform a mini moray using a final judgment. It is almost always worth it to use final judgment as opposed to hooking a third time because it is insanely quick and it removes any chance for a last minute save as well as saving the hook on the map. One other thing worth noting is that cages will relocate if you get too close to them. If you are closer than 5 meters for 3.5 seconds, the cage will relocate to a different cage spawn and will pause the timer, so don't stand too close to cages. Okay, so those are my main tips and tricks for playing Pyramid Head. Overall, here are my main takeaways. 1. Try to get survivors tormented as often as possible. This will allow you the option to use your caging or mini mori power. 2. Use your power to zone survivors. If they vault, use your punishment at the damned attack. If they don't vault, cancel and use your normal attack. And 3. Be patient. Executioner has a steep learning curve, so he can definitely be a little frustrating at first, but once you get the basics under your belt, you can start having fun with the more ambitious attacks. Alright, next we're going to cover all of Executioner's add-ons, which kind of pains me a little because Pyramid Head has some sad add-ons. I really hope the developers rework them soon because they are really simple, they don't really change his playstyle much, and a lot of the ones besides the top tier ones are just not even worth running. So I have my tier list here, and I'm going to work through each of them from best to worst so you know which ones are worth running. First up are the range add-ons, which in my opinion are Executioner's best add-ons. These add-ons extend the reach of your Punishment of the Damned attack to be able to further reach survivors. These are especially useful when survivors are vaulting windows and pallets that are just slightly out of your reach, or when they are stuck in a hallway or door frame, or when they're rescuing another survivor from a cage or hook. These add-ons, especially the green add-on, allow you to get hits that probably seem a little unfair to the survivors. Your base range is 8 meters, which is actually pretty good for most loops, but having that little extra distance can sometimes make the difference between getting the hit and not getting the hit. Um, so the green add-on gives you an extra 1.5 meters, the yellow add-on gives you an extra meter, and the brown add-on gives you an extra 0.5 meters. These also work really well with perks that have aura reading capabilities, such as I'm all ears or a nurse's calling. Most likely you'll want to be stockpiling these add-ons. Next up, we have the duration add-ons. By default, you start with a total of five seconds of being able to use your rights of judgment power, which is when you're dragging your sword on the ground, which you can then use for your punishment of the damned attack. These add-ons increase the duration of that power gauge. Again, in most normal circumstances, five seconds uh, is plenty uh, as it replenishes pretty quickly and you don't need to have your power gauge full in order to use your punishment of the damned attack. But these add-ons can be useful in a lot of situations such as uh, maybe you're looping at a survivor at shack and they are trying to dodge out of the way of your punishment of a damned attack. You can keep your sword on the ground and keep running the loop until you're right next to them then cancel it and hit them with a normal attack or wait till they vault the pallet or window uh, and then use your punishment of the damned attack. These can also be useful if you're trying to put down lots of trails on the ground to get sur survivors tormented, or if you like to repeatedly use your punishment of the damned attack. Uh, these add-ons are really useful, especially the green add-on. Okay, so if you just want to know the best add-ons to use, I would recommend using the green range add-on, which is the Burning Man painting, um, and either stacking this with the green duration add-on, which is the Tablet of the Oppressor, or stacking the two best range add-ons, which is the Burning Man painting, with the wax doll. Uh, but I think those are the two best add-on combos for Pyramid Head. But regardless, you probably want to be stockpiling up on the range add-ons and the duration add-ons when you are leveling up your Pyramid Head's blood web. But I'm going to continue down the tier list. Next, I have one of his iridescent add-ons, the far better of the two, which is the Eerie Seal of Metatron. This add-on lets you see tormented survivors when you cage a survivor for six seconds. 
this is pretty good info, uh, almost serving as like a mini barbecue for caging survivors. This can be helpful in determining what gens they are working on or potentially giving you the location of a survivor you might want to chase next. I'd say the limitations of this are that in most games, you probably won't have all of your survivors tormented, so you'll be a little more limited in the info that you get. It also depends on how often you cage people and how often you torment people, and some survivors are really adamant in not trying to get tormented, um, so it can, it can vary from game to game. So overall, I'd say this is a pretty good add-on, and I'd say it's worth using, uh, but it's not terribly game-changing. Uh, next up, we have the Duration of Trails add-ons. These add-ons simply increase the time that your Rights of Judgment trails remain in the environment. The base time is 75 seconds, which is a fairly long time. Uh, these can be fun for some more gimmicky builds, but in general, I would say they're not too useful. They can be better on smaller and indoor maps, where th there are areas that survivors more frequently run by. I will also point out that there is an upper limit to how many trails can exist in the environment at any given time. If you put down too many trails, they will start to replace your oldest trails. Uh, so keep that in mind if you want to go around the map, putting trails down everywhere. So these are okay, and they can definitely be fun in some situations. Next, we have the Lost Memories book. This add-on makes survivors that run over your trails oblivious for 15 seconds. Oblivious is a good status effect, but 15 seconds is a really short amount of time. Also, normally when survivors are running over your trails, they are actively being chased by you. So you're not gonna sneak up on them. They're still going to know that you're there behind them. This can work on newbie survivors, but good survivors will see that they're oblivious and know that you are still chasing them. So overall, not too useful. Next is a similar add-on, which is the rust-colored egg, which makes survivors uh, that run over your trails afflicted with the blindness status effect for 60 seconds. So a worse status effect of blindness as opposed to oblivious, but a longer duration of 60 seconds. It's okay, again, if you're chasing them and then hooking or caging that survivor, 60 seconds of blindness really doesn't do much if they're just sitting on a hook. Uh, also, I will point out that blindness does not affect pyramid head cages. You can see them through blindness, similar to a pig's boxes. So overall, again, not that great of an add-on. Next, we have the three power recovery add-ons. These decrease the recharge time of your power. For a lot of killers, recovery add-ons are some of their best add-ons, but for Executioner, you don't need to have your power gauge full in order to use it. You can use it as long as you have any charges, so it is not as important. If you want to use your power more, I would recommend using the power duration add-ons instead because they increase your total power gauge instead of just your recovery. So since these are just worse versions of other add-ons and I can't really see a use in, in, in having these as opposed to those, uh, I'm going to rank them pretty, pretty low here. Next, we have the Crimson Ceremony book. Now, this was the hardest one for me to judge because it was recently changed. The add-on itself wasn't changed, but the hemorrhage status effect was updated in the latest patch. This used to be by far Executioner's worst add-on because the only thing it did was this first bullet point, which is that it made tormented survivors bleed more. And this was not helpful even a little bit because tormented survivors literally have barbed wire extending from their shoes, making them extremely easy to track. So this add-on is definitely better than it used to be, but I'm not exactly sure how good it'll be. If you are tormenting survivors, having hemorrhage on them could be annoying for them if they run out of medkit charges or you interrupt them healing. It's also helpful to countering a survivor's 99 heals, but I think it's just a lot of conditions to make it work. You have to first torment them, which usually happens when you're chasing them. So unless survivors are running over trails while they're not in chase, you have to first torment survivors in chase, then either stop chasing them or you have to down and hook them instead of caging them so that they keep their torment. And then you have to interrupt them healing or have them stop healing for some reason. I just think it's way too many conditions and not enough gain if you do get it to work. I definitely think there's potential for it to be higher than this, but I think I have to put it here for now. Next, we have the other eerie add-on, which is the Obsidian Goblet. This is probably one of the worst eerie add-ons in the entire game. It makes you undetectable when you're 
standing on a rights of judgment trail, kind of as like an add-on version of the perk Insidious. Now, this doesn't work when you are moving and dragging your sword on the ground. You have to physically stop and stand on your torment trails. I tried to play around with this add-on. I want it to be better than it is, but I just really don't think there's much of a purpose to it besides, you know, camping hooks, which I am not going to recommend that you do. Your time is very limited as killer, so you want to be moving and exerting pressure as much as possible, and this just doesn't help you accomplish that, so I would not recommend using it. Alright, so last and least, uh, I have the Killer Instinct Duration add-ons, and it's crazy to me that the devs decided to dedicate three whole add-ons to increasing the Killer Instinct Duration. Instinct triggers when survivors run over your rights of judgment trails, and, and I keep saying run over, but it also triggers when survivors are walking over trails as well. Most of the time that they do that, you are actively in chase with them, so you know where they are already. Sometimes survivors will walk or run over your trails across the map, but the base three seconds is fine enough to see their general location. There's just no real point to these for me. Sure, you can try to get a punishment of the damned attack through a wall using the extended killer instinct, but the killer instinct isn't as exact as an aura reading ability, and again, you're chasing them. You kind of know where they are already. Um, these are not good. Um, I mean, at least they do a little bit of something, but not much. I would say there's no real point to using them. We've reached the end of our add-on tier list. Pretty underwhelming overall, but I would definitely say there are some add-ons use worth using, mostly the ones in this best in good tier. Okay, next we're going to go through some perks to use on Pyramid Head. Now, I'm not going to go through a tier ranking of all of the killer perks because there are almost a hundred killer perks in the game and a lot of them are not that useful. So I'm just going to highlight some of the best perks to run. Now, disclaimer, there are many other perks besides these and I think there are a lot of perks that can work out on Executioner, especially if you have the right build for it such as if you're doing like a themed build, like a totem build or a gen kicking build. Um, so don't discredit all other perks besides these ones. These are just some of the best options for standalone perks in my opinion. So I'm gonna break them down into three different categories. First up, I have perks that are good on every killer, which are the game slowdown perks. Most of these have to deal with gen regression or slowdown. These perks prolong the game in order to give you enough time to chase and hook survivors. So we have the following perks. We have Corrupt Intervention, which activates when you spawn into the map and blocks the three furthest generators for two minutes. This is good for having a good early game. Next, I have Hex Ruin, which regresses any gens that survivors are not actively working on. You can also pair this perk with Hex Undying if you are worried about survivors cleansing your ruin quickly. Um, next, I have Deadlock, which blocks the most progressed generator whenever another generator is completed. Then we have a Scourge Hook Pain Resonance, which regresses the most progressed generator, and that gen loses 15% of its progression when hooking a survivor on a Scourge Hook. Next is Dead Man's Switch, which blocks generators if survivors stop working on them for 45 seconds after you hook a survivor. Pop Goes the Weasel, which when you kick a generator after you hook a survivor, causes that gen to lose 25% of its progression. And finally, I have No Way Out, which is the only non-gen related perk. Uh, this perk blocks exit gates for a certain amount of time, and the time increases for how many different survivors you have hooked throughout the game. Now, these are all good perks to consider. Uh, these last four perks, however, do have the kind of the caveat that they are related to getting hooks. So these perks, I would say, are a slightly less good on Executioner than they are on other killers because one of Executioner's powers is their ability to cage survivors instead of hooking them, which saves a lot of time. However, that doesn't mean you should discount these perks and all hooking related perks. These are still really good perks despite having to hook. You will not be caging every single survivor that you down, and even if survivors are tormented, you can always choose whether or not you want to hook or cage them. Sometimes hooking is the better option, especially if you have perks that can benefit from them. Next, we have information perks. Info perks are great on any killer, but I would say Executioner particularly benefits from aura reading perks because they allow you to get hits through walls and obstacles using your punishment of the damned attack, which can be very clutch. So we have four aura reading perks here, including I'm All Ears, which shows you a survivor's aura after they perform a medium or fast vault near you. 
You have a nurse's calling, which shows you the auras of survivors that are healing nearby. You have hex retribution, which shows you the auras of survivors after a hex totem is cleansed or blessed. This also has a, another oblivious side effect as well. And then finally, we have Scourge Hook Floods of Rage, which shows you the auras of all other survivors after a survivor is unhooked from a Scourge Hook. I also have three, what I'm going to call general information perks here. These perks are good for letting you know generally where survivors are. And first up, I have Infectious Fright, which is not quite an aura reading perk, but it's like almost because when you use this perk, all of the survivors in your terror radius will scream and reveal their location. So it'll be kind of like a bubble instead of an aura. Now, this is a really amazing perk for Executioner. I think it's very underrated. One, Executioner has a lot of snowball potential with his ability to quickly injure and down survivors. So knowing where survivors are when you down a survivor can help snowball certain situations for you. Additionally, Infectious Fright is super helpful when deciding when to hook versus cage tormented survivors. Infectious Fright lets you know if there are other survivors nearby that you can chase. If so, if there are, you can quickly cage and move on to them. If there are no screams from an Infectious Fright, it might be worthwhile to hook that survivor instead. Super underrated perk on Executioner. I think it's one of the best you can run. Next, I have a Discordance, which can tell you what gens survivors are working on. And finally, I have Whispers, which can let you know what areas of the map survivors are at. If you don't have some of these other perks unlocked, I think this is a great free perk um, that can give you a lot of information. And so finally, I have three stealth perks here. Whereas other killers might run a chase perk as their fourth perk, I think Executioner can benefit more from stealth perks. The biggest counterplay to Pyramid Head is holding W and pre-throwing pallets. So these perks allow you to close that gap in order to get closer to survivors in order to secure more injury states. I definitely don't think having a stealth perk is necessary, but I think these are three very good options for perks. First up, I have Hex Plaything, which causes survivors that you hook to become oblivious until they cleanse their cursed Hex Totem. Next is Tinker, which makes you undetectable and shows you the location of a gen uh, when it reaches 70% progression. I think this is a great combo of a stealth perk and an information perk. Um, I really like using this perk on Executioner. I run it on a lot of my builds. And then finally, I have Monitor and Abuse, which reduces your terror radius when you are not in a chase, allowing you to get closer to survivors before they hear you coming and have a chance to run. Okay, so these are some perks that I think work really well on Pyramid Head. Now let's try to construct ourselves a build. If you don't know what to do here, I might recommend thinking about this template in order to fill out your perk slots. In general, two or so game slowdown perks can be nice to prolong the game in order to secure chases and hook states. I would recommend having at least one information perk to help inform your decisions. And then having your final perk be whatever perk you want to fill whatever niche you think you need to fill. This can be an, another information perk or a stealth perk or whatever perk you want to run. Again, this is just a general template to help you if you want, but totally not necessary to have your perks fit into these categories. And finally, the last thing I wanna do in this video is highlight two sample builds here to give you an idea of good perks if you are having trouble. In my first build, I have the Burning Man painting and the Wax Stall, which are the two best range add-ons. You can pair these with Corrupt Intervention, Deadlock, I'm all ears in Tinkerer. Corrupt Intervention and Deadlock will help slow down gens by blocking them. Tinkerer will let you know what gens are almost completed and let you sneak up on survivors. And I'm all ears will help you get hits after survivors vault pallets or windows in chase. And the two range add-ons pair really well with I'm all ears to allow you to get survivors that are just out of your reach. For my second build, um, I went for a little bit of a different strategy. I have the same Burning Man painting paired with the best power duration add-on, which is the Tablet of the Oppressor. And then for the perks for this build, I have the combo of Scourge Hook Pain Resonance and Dead Man Switch. Uh, these perks together will help you have the effect that after you hook a survivor on a Scourge Hook, survivors working on the most progress generator will scream, which will kick them off the generator for a second, which will then get blocked with Dead Man Switch. I also have this paired with Scourge Hook Floods of Rage to give you the ability to see the auras of survivors um, when that survivor gets unhooked from the Scourge Hook. And finally, I have Infectious Fright, which I talked about earlier, but I think it works really well in this build because it lets you know the location of other survivors when you down someone, letting you know when is a good time to hook 
versus cage survivors. And all right, that's it. I think that's all I have for the video. I hope this guide helps you become a better pyramid head main. If you have any other questions that I didn't answer throughout the video, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and I will try my best to answer them. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll catch you all in the next video.